So this is where we got to in the last lesson. What did the, all about the tensions, raising, and the actual revolts themselves, okay? So this is where we got to, and please, please do finish this off. If you have, I think you might have already done it um, there, so if you want to transpose it or not, it's totally up to you. But let's talk about the actual revolt in Upper Canada, okay? Now, the, the difference in many ways between Upper Canada and Lower Canada is that the revolt in Upper Canada is never in doubt. There's too much loyalist strength, and there's a lack of support for hapless rebels, okay? The rebels were not well organized. Mackenzie himself was not the most popular person in the world, uh, certainly in Upper Canada, and he didn't have the same uh, drive or, or the same, um, same ability as, for example, Papineau, which we'll get into in a bit, okay? There just wasn't enough uh, original support. Yeah, sure, there was a lot of tensions and everything, however, there wasn't enough for people to go, we need to revolt. There wasn't, there wasn't the desire to, to go for the most extreme uh, version of, of disagreement, okay? And maybe it's because there just wasn't enough of a plan afterwards, okay? And that's something that you might think about. However, in December 1837, lower, the Lower Canada revolts, okay? So the Lower Canada starts this whole thing first. And that inspired, Mackenzie, if you remember, he's the, he's the guy who's head of the reform movement, and a thousand men to attack a family, com uh, family compact businesses, okay? So we're talking about within towns itself, not as much as villages, it's mostly within towns as well as Toronto, for example. So you do have a revolt of sorts, okay? It's a thousand men attacking businesses owned by the family compact, okay? But it's had to... They, because essentially, I suppose, lower, in Lower Canada, they thought um, the revolt was going much better, and so they thought in Upper Canada, it's our turn now. So, in a way, that's what they did. On the 5th of December, a few hundred rebels scatter against a very, very small group of loyalist forces. They're essentially loyalist militia. So the first sign of some sort of uh, resistance, and then it's instantly shattered. So this is the one thing to think about uh, compared to when we looked at the American Revolution, okay? As soon as there were some, as soon as there were, was resistance, it's not as if the Americans scattered at all. What they did was they stood and fought. Whilst they lost battles, if you remember, they were Pyrrhic victories for the British, and they were, essentially, they were long-term wins for the Americans. For, for those in Upper Canada, they had no such start. They had no such um, thing to go by. There's no... Um, that there's no brave, brave people fighting and dying for what would become Upper Canada. They just immediately scatter uh, against a group of. Okay, there's the, the British have a lot of a lot of um, have a lot are quite, are quite strong in the area, but even against a smaller force, the the rebels essentially scatter. And after the fifth of December. Loyalist troops, essentially British troops, I suppose, come on into Upper Canada and it kills off any further hopes of revolt. There's no point of revolting in the first place if you know you're already outgunned. Fatima. Yes. Do you need to? And in January 1838, Mackenzie only has 600 in the, in, uh, of, his, um, of his rebels in what he calls the New Provisional State. So he's already promising land and is arrested in the United States, okay? So he, 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 he's, he's quite a terrible leader in many ways. He, he thought he could galvanize enough. Um, he thought that, you know, if they at least stand, at least there's some aggression, people will follow him, okay? He did not know how many people essentially would follow him. He took his re rebellion, his revolution for granted in terms of popularity in Upper Canada. He thought that enough people were so angry, more would join him. Remember, about 350,000 people are, here, are living here, and he could only galvanize 1,000 men. So if you think about that in terms of pure numbers, it is terrible. Okay? So in, at the end of the day, he only has 600 after, in, and so, so essentially he's lost 400 men, not dead or anything like that. They've just given up within a matter of a month. 
So whereas revolutions tend to snowball, they don't sort of explode into a massive scene of, of aggression. Okay, remember the American Revolution took a while to build up. You had to have, they had to have a Boston massacre. Well, not much of a massacre. They had to have that. They had to have uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill. They had to have the um, Battle of Saratoga in order to get them going. In, 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 upper, in Upper Canada, you do not get any of that at all. What happens essentially after Mackenzie gets arrested and essentially the revolt sort of peters out, um, there's a mass exodus of rebels that go to America. It's like, well, if you don't like us, you can go south and live there, okay? So in a way, the, 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 it's not as if a battle managed to wipe them out it, in, in many ways, although when we get to Lord Durham, he does deal with rebels and uh, that still exists, but there's a mass exodus already and what happens is that kind of deals with the problem for the British in many ways. And from, 18, from 1837 on, there's no talk of rebellion, and there's a desire this time to make Upper Canada fully British. Yes. Okay. They, they to go absolutely full, um, full British. So that, so that in, t in terms of rebellion, it's, it's all done. You know, Upper Canada could not, could not be safer now. It's one of those very odd things. You know, usually if there's a rebellion, if you squash the rebellion, you've still got the problem of uh, rebellious behavior. You've still got the idea of, well, one day we'll come back and we'll, 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 we'll try again or something like that. Here, absolutely nothing. There's not a problem. Upper Canada becomes much safer now. Well, thanks to the exodus, thanks in some sense to Lord Durham, but also because that's the reaction. Okay? So a lot of people got turned off by the idea of, of revolution here. So it's very interesting, especially when you consider the dynamic that, if you remember what we were talking about Upper Canada, migration was quite recent here. Okay, when we're talking about people who've only been there for about, um, in some, some senses, eight, sometimes 10 or even just 20 years. Okay? I think Mackenzie came to Canada in 1820. Himself was only there for yeah, 18 years. Okay, So we're talking about people who had not been there very long. So maybe there wasn't enough time to build up a Canadian identity? Possibly. If you're talking about like, the, diff the, the parallels between uh, America and Upper Canada, we're talking about people who've been there for a long, long time and people who have been only there for 30 years. So you can now start to see... What? Um, I mean, if, am I not my thing not good enough? It is. I just don't get it. First time. So there's no. There's a desire to make Upper Canada fully British. Okay. So moderate reformers would return to assist Lord Durham here. So it's we're going back from polarisation, from people on one side and people on the other. And we're now starting to slam people, two people together. Okay, back into moderates. Okay, so people like Robert Baldwin, of course, would start to make more of an appearance, and that's why, in many ways, the idea of responsible government comes back into it because that's what reformers wanted, uh, moderate reformers wanted. So let's talk about Lower Canada. Very, very different kettle of fish. Okay. Remember, the French community is completely excluded from the Executive Council, and you know, made, made even harder for, that, uh, for the French community to get in, thanks to Lord Downing, to making sure that there's, there's the British who control the Executive, and the French who essentially control the Legislative. In 1828, if you remember the Canadian Committee report, is being ignored in terms of what the Canadian Committee uh, was saying, is that there has to be some sort of political change. Some, something has to give. Remember, this was the whole idea that uh, in 1828 they, they, they said that they need to reform the political system, but because of the political upheaval and evil in Britain, there just wasn't enough time to do that, or there just wasn't the impetus, I suppose, to do so. Okay? And that was, of course, a big factor. Pat, and, and of course it is to the French, because they said, look, even the British are saying that there needs to be some sort of change. And the fact that they've been ignored by the very British council, uh, by, by the British Executive Council, is a very, very mass damning um, problem here. 
So Papineau, as I've mentioned over and over again, made the French wing, the French, um, what do you call it, the French party within the Legislative Council more anti-British. The Patriot. The, the Patriot, yes, is his party, I suppose. Yeah, yeah he made it more anti-British. Not, this is more important, not pro-American, okay? So it's following the idea that this wasn't exactly a desire to become a, a, a republic similar to the US, as you mentioned when we were going through the question, but certainly just anti-British, okay? So this is very, very different and a lot more ideologically different, okay? Sorry. So you, very ideologically different, and in a sense it's very, very much almost impossible to reconcile. How do you reconcile French and British people in general, really. I mean, we've been fighting each other for years. Like, this is a very, a very difficult uh, situation in many ways. So, as we said, so there's Papineau is inspired by the 1830 uh, French Revolution and just general economic issues, and we've already gone through the question. And 92 resolutions are demanded. 92 sort of quite drastic changes are demanded, and there's obviously far too many to go through, I suppose. But anyway, when we're thinking about why the, the French got more polarised, why they sort of become more and more anti-British, in a sense it's mostly because there's a lot of increased immigration. Same thing that's happening in Upper Canada, and we can, we, can, we can have mentioned it here, I suppose, as well. And a shrinking econo economy, increased radical sentiment, okay? So we have, quite, we have two very interesting power dynamics here. We have society, and the fact that it's immigration that's changing um, society in many ways, especially when it's now diluting the French influence and the shrinking economy, a lot of it's to do with French land tenure, okay? Because if you compare the economies of Upper Canada and Lower, Upper Canada's doing much better. Okay, remember the Canadian companies, yeah? What's French land tenure? What's French land tenure? Do you remember it from last week? French land tenure was like the landlord system. Okay, so it's not rather than being so, things being sold off via the Canada company, which was working and building infrastructure and selling off land in Upper Canada and Lower Canada. Essentially, landlords own different, basically, lots of areas of land, and people were tenants, not they didn't own the land themselves. And that was basically a terrible idea. In 1832, a cholera outbreak, which is not very nice. Uh, and an election debacle in, in terms of to the Legislative Assembly in which two people were shot. Uh, again, push uh, and polarise people in different areas. And of course, the radicals of the, pa of the Patriot, the Patrioti or Patrio, are dominant in the party and assembly. Okay, so the, these sort of extremists, I suppose, uh, French, French wing are now elected and now have more of a voice, okay? So now you're seeing the very big difference between this and the more haphazard approach in Upper Canada. In 1835, there's something called the Gos Gosford Commission of Lower Canada, which is like a commission saying, looking into the tension. They obviously knew that something was going on. But what they did was they made public, they made public the British refusal for constitutional change. Once again, talking about how much change that was going on in Britain at the time, for example, the Great Reform Act, which was in 1832. So even there, three years ago, the British refused to change the constitution, to make things better, to make it more, um, to, to make the executive more in line with the assembly. Remember that now you've got even more French people in the assembly, more, more radicals, I suppose, yet the executive stays the same, okay? So on the 6th of March, 19, uh, 1837, you have the Russell Resolutions, the, the demanded resolutions, which is rejecting reform and opening the lieutenant governor to public funds, allocating money owed by Lower Canada to British officials. Okay, so this is, so you have the, these radical resolutions and now you have the Russell Resolutions, completely different, who are rejecting reform and opening the lieutenant governor to allow essentially to deal with public funds. So dealing with money raised through taxation. Okay, so this is, send, this is sending people over the edge in many ways, okay? Not only that, 
But as things get worse and worse, they outlaw protests and meetings, they close banks, there's an increased military persistence, presence, and that leads to revolt, okay? So as you can see, it's a domino effect, isn't it? It's a complete domino effect. You have the, you have the inherent executive council being uh, domino falling over. You have the Canadian committee report being ignored, another domino falling over. Papineau making the French wing more anti-British, another domino falling over. Um, you have the 92 resolutions being demanded and essentially being ignored, along with the geopolitical uh, state making revolution more likely, another domino falling over. Increased immigration and a shrinking economy within, within Lower Canada itself, you've guessed it, another domino falling over. You have yeah, an election debacle and, debacle and more of the radical uh, French people being elected in the assembly. Yes, another domino. People now know that the British are not going to change the constitution themselves. Another domino. You have the Russell resolutions rejecting reform and essentially meaning, making, giving the lieutenant governor more powers over public funds. Outlawing protest meetings, closure of banks, increased military presence. That's all the dominoes. Down. Revolt is inevitable. And that's what happens. Does that make sense? It's very, very different to when we looked at Upper Canada, which was mostly to do with, in, in some ways, immigration. Okay, It was much fewer reasons for revolt. Uh, in terms of elections, it looked like, you know, they... The, the reformers would, would try to be nice, try to be uh, conciliatory. They went through the ballot box. They're still ignored. In fact, things get even worse. Okay, so you can see the differences between the two are so, so clear. And this all lends to the whole reason why the rebellions are so different. Because there are two completely different elements going on here. Okay, you have an absolutely massive alienated majority, or, or dwindling majority, as we know from increased immigration, okay? So the, uh, putting the lieutenant governor on public funds, is that what is meant by the civil list? Yes. Okay. Exactly that. So essentially it's, it's, it's circumventing the legislative assembly's uh, power over money. Is that, well, we'll just put on a civil list, which means that they get paid. That's how it works. Okay. Should we move on? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, well, actually, I can leave it up here for now. It, well, hopefully, on the other side, of, on one well, of the sheets I gave you, uh, you should be able to fill in those that, that, those boxes incredibly easily. Um, if I, I recommend doing that, if you can, a moment or now. I mean, I, let's uh, let's. Do you want to do that now? Yeah, okay, I'm going to pause the video, which has only gone for 18 minutes, and hope.